What's up, everyone? Today is a very special show. I'm here with sci-fi author, TV and screenwriter, and best of all, a fellow Twilight Zone fan, Mark Scott Zickery. Hi, guys. <laughs> Mark, how are you doing today, sir? I'm great. This is uh, thrilled to be here and uh, really looking forward to our talk. Well, I'm very happy to have you here. It's, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, right. Both ways. I know some of our more diehard Twilight Zone fans out there, they're already going to know you. You're the author of the landmark, best-selling, critically acclaimed Twilight Zone Companion. Boom, there we go. Hey. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send that out to you to, uh, to autograph. Of course. You know, this has been like my Bible here on the channel. I've been using it since I've started. It's, it's my go-to uh, number one resource. In addition to being a writer of the Twilight Zone Companion, Mark has also written the best-selling Magic Time trilogy, and he's written and produced for countless TV shows over the years. Mark's yeah. writing credits include Space Command, Star Trek The Next Generation, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, and animated series that some of us grew up on. I prefer quiet meals. It's noted when you first began your journey writing the book, your goal was to create an oral history of the classic show as told by those who made it. But what was the spark that ignited that fire for you? Well, well, the three TV shows that made me want to be a writer uh, were uh, the original Star Trek, the original Outer Limits, and the original Twilight Zone. And, uh, and particularly Twilight Zone and Outer Limits, there was sort of a guiding genius behind those shows, Gene Roddenberry and Rod Serling. And, and Gene was clearly highly influenced by Rod Serling. Rod was the, um, the, the, the really the, at the top of the heap in terms of, you know, just brilliant, just brilliant. And uh, by the time I got out of college, initially I wondered if I was going to be a writer or a visual artist and my degree is in painting, sculpture and graphic arts. But when I was 19, I went to the Clarion Writers Workshop, which is the leading science fiction writing workshop in the country. And I sold my first short story. And so I came back and finished my final two years at UCLA, but I knew after selling that first short story that I wanted to be a writer. And uh, it was only two years after Rod's death uh, that I decided I would write The Twilight Zone Companion. And uh, I'd met George Clayton Johnson, one of the great Twilight Zone writers uh, when I was a teenager at a convention and we'd become friends. And so I started by interviewing him and then he connected me up with Buck Houghton and Jerry Soule, the producer and writer on the show. And, uh, and I, knew, I knew I couldn't go directly to Carol Serling, Rod's widow, because she had already turned down major journalists who'd wanted to write about Rod and the zone. And I thought, I'm a 21, 22 year old kid with no credits other one, than one short story uh, sale. She's gonna say no. So what I did was I spent th um, three months interviewing over 30 people who'd worked on the show before I went to Carol Serling. And if she had said no, it would have been no, and I, would, I wouldn't have you know, moved forward. But um, I, by then I knew a lot about the subject. I felt very sure I could pull it off. And um, so I made my pitch to her. It was, it was at Rod's house in Pacific Palisades. It was exactly as he'd left it. One room was just for the, for the awards, the six Emmys and so forth, the Peabody Award. And um, his Irish setter was still there, his dog, and his and his office in the back of the house was still there with all the science fiction paperbacks that had that were stamped CBS property of CBS on the inside front cover. I mean, it was just phenomenal. And um, so I made my pitch to Carol, and clearly she called some of the people I'd interviewed and said, "What do you think of this kid?" And they said, "Well, he seems like he can do it." And so then Carol came back and she said, "You've got full access to everything." And so I I was literally crawling through Rod Serling's attic, um, pulling down these big scrapbooks of clippings on Rod's career, um, you know, going through his files, taking home his film prints, his 16 millimeter prints of Twilight Zone episodes with the original commercials, the coming attraction spots. And now, Mr. Serling. Next week, you'll see these bandages unwrapped and you'll get a good close look at the face beneath them. I mean, this is... When I started the book, there, there weren't even VCRs. Mm -hmm. I was recording the audio off television and those were in syndication. So they were chopping minutes out of them. And, um, and so from the month I started the Twilight Zone Companion to the month it came out was five years. And at that same time, I started writing for animation, the shows you mentioned and real Ghostbusters and pole position and on and on just time. I was the God of animation, but my main project during that period was the Twilight Zone book. And I, I was writing it for two reasons. One was, I wanted to write about Twilight Zone. I wanted to explore in depth that how, how a brilliant television show is made, what leads to it, what comes together to make that happen. But also I wanted to learn how to write and produce 
great television myself. Mm -hmm. And so this was like my graduate school because there were no classes in that at the time. There, this, we're talking like I started working on the book in 1977 and it came out in 82. So uh, I was um, educating myself, learning from the greatest people who had ever created television. And so, and other than Rod and Charles Beaumont and one director, Montgomery Pittman, uh, everyone else was still alive. And so I got to interview all the producers, all the major directors, all the major actors, on and on. You know, George Clemens, the brilliant uh, director of photography. And, and uh, so, so I, I racked up over 100 hours of interviews of, from, from talking to those people, Anne Francis, Burgess Meredith, Ross Martin, et cetera, Bill Mooney. And, uh, and, you know, it was, it was amazing. It was wonderful. And I'm so glad I did that because now, of course, most of them are gone. You know, Bill Mumy and I are working on Space Command. He's in the cast. But, um, but, you know, once they're gone, they're gone. And those stories are lost. I was up in Rod's attic and uh, there was a box and it was an unmarked box. And I opened it and it was full of Twilight Zone scripts that had been commissioned but never made. And there were scripts by Matheson and Beaumont and two scripts by Ray Bradbury. Ray is only credited with one episode of The Twilight Zone, I Sing the Body Electric. But oddly, all of his protégés were hired on the writing staff. So it was Matheson, Richard Matheson, Charles Beaumont, George Clayton Johnson, those were three of his protégés. So I thought, well, something's awry here. And there was a cover letter that, that Ray had written, a note in his hand that he had written to Rod saying, here's the first of what I think, what you know, what will be many Twilight Zone scripts, looking forward to it, you know. And so Ray was originally going to be one of the major contributors to, to Twilight Zone, and it certainly makes sense. But I started to hear from people when I was interviewing them that there had been a break, that they had had a, a bad break in their friendship, and but they never talked about it publicly, either of them. And so I wrote to Ray Bradbury at the time to uh, see if he'd let me interview him about this. And he wrote back a, a short note saying, I prefer not to talk you know, or, or write about Twilight Zone, what my work stands for itself. Years later, decades later, he and I became very good friends. And uh, I'd go over to his house once a month for over 10 years just to talk about life and career and writing. And finally, I didn't even tell him I wrote the Twilight Zone book because I knew that there was, a, there was some bitterness there. Finally, we became friends to a degree that I could say, look, look, tell me what happened between you and Rod. And he did. And on, on my YouTube channel on Mr. Sci-Fi, I said, I, I told the story. I said, okay, it's going to take a while to tell, get a cup of coffee, you know, <laughs> relax. And it took me 30 minutes to relate the wow. amazing story that, that, that Ray Bradbury told me about how they, how they broke apart. Just like a science fiction, that's what she is. A regular Ray Bradbury. But it was fascinating. And, and again, you know, so it was, it was really great to unlock the secrets of the Twilight Zone. Uh, and it started my career and I've, I've been successful as a, as a TV writer um, ever since. You know, so it's, it, I, I learned the lessons that Twilight Zone taught me. This is one of the out of the way places, the unvisited places. If there had been a sixth season, did Rod have anything in the works and was there anything in progress? Yes, it was funny because when, see, the, what happened with Rod was that television changed. And so as a result, because he came from the era, the, the 50s, the live TV era, where those first generation of TV writers were trying to create sort of a Broadway stage for the entire country. The mm -hmm. idea that you could do serious drama and meaningful shows that would comment on the world. And that's what Rod wanted to do. He wanted to be the Arthur Miller of television. And, but then, of course, the censorship stopped him from commenting on race, on politics, on social issues. And he created Twilight Zone, not because he had ever aspired to be a science fiction writer, but simply because that allowed him to bypass the censors because they didn't think if, if, so, if a story was with robots or set on Mars or whatever, they wouldn't guess that he was commenting on the real world. And uh, so he got away with it for five seasons. But by then, you were into the 60s, like 1964. And, and the whole strategy was on all three, and there were only three networks, that was it. Three, three places you could go to sell stuff. And if you didn't sell it to them, you were out of luck. And uh, the, the philosophy that had changed is we don't want anything. We don't want serious drama. We don't want anything that's going to upset anybody. We don't want to ruffle people's feathers. We want the largest audience possible. And so we have to have programming that's essentially meaningless. And so they started, and, and that's not a bad thing necessarily if, if it's not the only thing. But, um, but then you start to get a lot of shows that were like, just didn't have a lot to say, I mean, like Maddox, yeah. Ironside in drama, or in, in comedy, you have great comedies, comedies I love. I Dream of Jeannie, Gilligan's Island, Hogan's Heroes, on and on. 
But that was what they wanted. They wanted something that was kind of like not going to offend anybody. And Rod mm -hmm. Serling clearly wasn't that guy. I, so I think by then, CBS, the head of CBS, was no fan of Twilight Zone. And, and at one point, uh, Rod came into William Frug's office and he was actually walking in on his knees. And he said, I think I just killed Twilight Zone because he'd apparently had some exchange with the, with the president of CBS and it hadn't gone well. And they uh. they'd canceled, they'd canceled Twilight Zone. So, um, so Rod then tried to get Twilight Zone going at one of the other networks and he couldn't use the name Twilight Zone. CBS had the rights to that. So he came up with you know, Rod Serling's, uh, you know, witches, werewolves and, and you know, whatever, you know, Triple W, because he'd done a book with that title. And and he also came up with another idea called Rod Serling's Wax Museum, which would be uh, where you'd have see this castle, a real castle in, in America somewhere at night. And then you'd go inside and there'd be the spooky room filled with wax figures that had hoods over their heads. And then Rod would walk up to one, pull off the hood, and it would be a wax figure of the star of that that episode and he would talk about it and it eventually evolved to, to night gallery. But, but he took this idea to uh, NBC and ABC, couldn't sell it. It didn't sell. And, uh, but he had a whole bunch of ideas. Yes. And there were a number of, of scripts he would have wanted to have written. And then when night gallery happened uh, a couple of years later, the problem was that Rod thought that he didn't want to be the showrunner. He had been the showrunner on Twilight Zone, the, basically the executive producer at the top, but it was a lot of work. And Rod thought, well, I'm getting older. I don't really want to be working around the clock. But of course he assumed that the guy put in charge of production would defer to Rod because he was the creator and host and writer of the show. And that was not what happened. Jack Laird, who was the producer on Night Gallery was knocking back a quart of vodka a day <laughs> and, uh, and was not at all the kind of producer that Buck Houghton had been on Twilight Zone, yeah. and they just butted heads the oh. entire time. Uh, and Rod wrote a lot of scripts for Night Gallery that were, were never made, and, and now I want to want to make those scripts. So I'm in conversation with the Serling uh, estate and the Serling family to do a new show called Rod Serling's After Twilight that would, cons would consist of scripts that Rod either wrote in the 50s that no one has seen in 70 years, live TV, or, yeah. and also scripts that Rod wrote for Night Gallery and other things that never got made. Rod used to dictate everything he wrote. He, he would dictate scripts and speeches and letters and everything all in that wonderful style of his. And they thought all of those dicta dictation recordings were lost and they just found a thousand of them. And so my plan is to take narration from those recordings and have Rod narrate the new show, which is called Rod, Rod Serling's After Twilight. So, and to hear his voice again. Yes. In some capacity. Yes. I mean, that's just... Yeah. To hear his voice on, in material that's never been heard before. Yeah, especially, yeah, yeah, especially. You've heard of trying to find a needle in a haystack? Well, stay with us now and you'll be part of an investigating team whose mission is not to find that proverbial needle, nor their task is even harder. During your journey researching and writing The Twilight Zone Companion, was there anything that just completely blew your mind? One of the eeriest, the one time I felt like I myself was in The Twilight Zone, <laughs> was I, I was reading a letter from Charles Beaumont to Rod Serling written during the run of the show. And you know, you, you have the sense almost like, like being Scrooge's ghost in A Christmas Carol where you're observing the past and no one can see or hear you, but you know, but you're looking at people who, who you're, you're, you're in the past reality of people who are now gone, who are now deceased. Rod was deceased and Beaumont was. And so it's a breezy little funny little letter, uh, Beaumont talking about casting one of his episodes and so forth. But instead of signing it sincerely or signing it yours truly, he signed it with a Latin phrase that I'd never seen. So I went to the dictionary and the Latin phrase what translated as in death, I am with you. And the hair on my neck just went up. It was just like, whoa. <laughs> so it was, uh, that was, that was my Twilight Zone moment writing the Twilight Zone Companion. Twilight Zone has had one movie and three TV revivals. Which of these journeys into the fifth dimension have you enjoyed the most? That's an interesting question. I mean, it's um, when they brought the show back in the 80s, I actually wrote for that version of it. And mm -hmm. it was an amazing writing uh, uh, group. It was Harlan Ellison, George R.R. R. Martin, Rockne O'Bannon, who went on to create Farscape and Alien Nation and so forth. And, uh, and it, was, it was a good show. It wasn't as consistently good as the original show, but they had some really, really, really good episodes. And, you know, and the Twilight Zone movie, you know, I like Nightmare 20,000 Feet, the version they did that George, George Miller directed.
but I don't think anything had the consistency of just incredible quality that the original show had. I think the the more recent uh, adaptations, the more recent recent reboots have been kind of um, uh, diminishing returns. You know, uh, I don't think I don't think they really were up to snuff. I'm a little late on it, but I've just started going into the Jordan Peele series. It's a little hit and miss so far, but I want to see all of it for better or worse. Yes, yes, and and again, you know, sometimes there'll be a good episode. It's just it's just different because mm. you get a sense that Jordan Peele is working on a whole bunch of different stuff and it's not his f total focus with Rod, you know, particularly the first few seasons of Twilight Zone, that was his baby and he was going to put everything he had into it and he did. Mm.